Prospect House Media. And now, prepare yourself for the only weekly podcast you won't want to miss. Welcome to the Ameritocracy Show with Troy Edgar, live from our studios in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. I am Troy Edgar, and welcome to the Ameritocracy Show. Thank you for tuning in and checking it out. It is greatly appreciated. This podcast examines the conditions for personal and economic growth and opportunity across America. This week, I went back home to Orange County, California, and met with former police chief and president of the California Police Chiefs Association, Eric Nunez. We really enjoyed catching up with each other. And this was the first time that we've had to be able to get together since my time as mayor of Los Alamitos and his retirement in 2022. The chief and I talked about his 31 year law enforcement career, becoming a police chief and his very important role in the California law enforcement as the president of Cal Chiefs. This was a job he had assumed one month after the George Floyd incident in March of 2020, pushing him into the national discussion on law enforcement reform. We ended our discussion talking about crime, law enforcement, and current public policy issues in California. These topics continue to be very important to businesses and residents who are on the verge of leaving the state. I hope you enjoy. Good morning, Eric. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Troy. Thank you. Thank Uh, you for having me here. uh, Thank you. It's uh, good to see you again. You too. Yeah. Um, you know, Eric, we uh, definitely have had a lot of uh, time together, uh, probably back through 2016, 18, as you took over as the police chief in Los Alamitos. Um, but outside of that, you know, a couple other areas that we've had a lot of time is Casa U Shelter. Uh, you got very involved in the community during your time as the police chief in Los Alamitos and then um, your Sunburst uh, Foundation work. And uh, probably the most compelling thing, and I've had a couple of people from Cal on this, but the most compelling thing is your degree from USC. (laughs) (laughs) Fight on. (laughs) Yeah, but uh, Eric, just uh, again, I wanted to thank you for being here. I didn't know if you had any opening comments before we get ready to kind of talk a little bit about your uh, story. No, I just, it's um, our relationship, like you said, goes back into 2016, and uh, and it was... um, it's been a great relationship, um, and I just had it's a pleasure to be here. I've uh, followed this podcast uh, once I heard about it, and uh, and it's uh, really uh, very special. Great, thank you. Um, a little bit about your 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 origin story and kind of where you started. Um, what I'm hoping to be able to do through today's interview is to give people a perspective of being a police chief, and um, sure. you know to, to paint the high picture before you fill in the details of uh, you know being a police chief is. Um, you know, uh, you know, your path to police chief is very interesting. So hopefully you can kind of fill that in. Um, and then I think you did something that was very fascinating to me at that time, being kind of a mayor or city council member, you're the police chief. Um, when you're on a city council, anybody that served realizes you are on the city council, the people voted for you in that city, but being on that kind of qualifies you as a good citizen. So you also serve on regional and county and sometimes state boards representing the county, not just the people that elected you. And um, and then you go and you serve on those boards while you're trying to still do a good job in your city. And, sure. and then sometimes at that level, those people are at a different level of political capability and professionalism. And, uh, and sometimes then there's a structure and you end up kind of rising up to different levels of leadership. And, um, you know, your story is being a a chief and doing all the great work for the community, but getting involved with Cal Chiefs. And we'll, I'll let you define that in a bit here, but basically the organization that is responsible to kind of help give a voice to all municipal police chiefs across the state of California. Um, You end up getting involved in that organization while being the police chief and, uh, and then ended up being a, a leader in California, really, uh, the president of that organization for a period of time. So uh, kind of with that, I, I would just like, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of give us the lead up that got you uh, to that point. Yeah, I, I, I was born uh, actually on a, in a mil, uh, military installation called uh, Fort MacArthur in San Pedro. My father was uh, in the service 
for eight years before he was killed in action in Vietnam on 13 June 1966. And uh, so I was born on, uh, on a military base, uh, was raised in military housing uh, for the first four years of my life, uh, and then uh, moved around a little bit um, after his death, and then was primarily raised in the city of Norwalk, southeast Los Angeles County, and, uh, and went through high school there. And then shortly after high school, I, I joined the service and then uh, was uh, eventually honorably discharged from the army, and then um, and I worked uh, several jobs as, as you do, kind of getting uh, through life. And then uh, I had cousins that were law enforcement officers, and one for Buena Park, one for Fullerton, that uh, kind of uh, talked to me about becoming a police officer. And uh, eventually, I, I did that. I, I found out that you could actually sponsor yourself uh, and go through uh, an academy. So I went through Golden West uh, uh, Criminal Justice Center's Police Academy in Huntington Beach, California. And uh, and then I wound up graduating, you know, really well. I had uh, number two in my class, president of the class, and most inspirational recruit, number one in academics, and all that kind of stuff, you know. So uh, and then I got recruited by two different agencies. I wound up going with the city of La Palma, and because they were willing to put me on the payroll immediately. And when you don't <laughs> when, when you don't have a job, you need one. Oh, yeah. So uh, you know, and I had uh, you know a child at the time, so one my first, and I, I needed to get. Uh, you know, secure uh, employment. And uh, I went with La Palma, and it was probably the best decision I'd made. Uh, I was uh, was with them for 25 years. During that 25 years, I rose to the rank of sergeant within first four years there, which is kind of... Incredible. Yeah, it's, and you get a lot of grief for some of the guys that have been around and have a lot more police tenure, but I was about the age that you would, because I had started later in life to become a police officer. So that you would promote to sergeant at that age. And then um, and then from there, I did that for nine years. And then um, I had become a captain. And then I did that for six years. And then I uh, became a chief in 2010. And I worked for uh, the city of La Palma for five years as their chief. And then I saw an opportunity uh, to come over to Los Alamitos and be their chief. And I did that for the last six years of my career. Hey, Eric, a uh, question for you as you were moving your way up through the ranks. What was the role of education in that process? Yeah, the education is vitally important, but it's uh, actually a requirement uh, for when you get into those command positions. And you, you won't make it to, say, the chief of police unless you have a master's degree and that kind of level. And so um, uh, I had acquired all the necessary education uh, for those positions that I, uh, that I ascended to. It's interesting. You, you mentioned the uh, the Justice Center the, at the Golden West, the police academy, um, you know, being on the council for 12 years. They, kind of the highlight would be um, the police chief, whoever it would be at that point, would say, hey, uh, you know, mayor, city council members, uh, we have been courting somebody working their way through the academy. Would you like to go to their graduation? And yeah. so... Uh, you know, you get to go there into this huge auditorium and just, um, and you see all this enthusiasm of these uh, young men and women that are getting ready to embark on a law enforcement career. And, um, and you just never know, like, how it's going to go, but you would get a perspective of how hard that, um, you know, that, that program was to get through. And like you said, when you say that you were kind of looked at it for your leadership, um, you know, definitely some of the tasks and the tests, you know, they put you under it. It definitely seemed like um, a process to weed out uh, people in the, in the very beginning. So it was, I was very impressed. Yeah, certainly. I think our class started off with 76 and we ended with 39. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like Navy SEALs. Yeah. Um, so question, uh, you know, we start to intersect 2016 and uh, you're taking over in the Los Al as the chief. Um, and I think uh, from a perspective of, you know, police chief, I think we'd had nine police chiefs in our history of 50 years. So it's, it's a job that usually people come in and they, they're there for a bit. Um, within the community uh, has a very important uh, symbolic perspective. You know, I remember my kids growing up in this area and, uh, you know, we would talk about things to do with the police and the, the police had a perception of being a little tough and rump, uh, uh, rough and tumble. You know, it was it was that type of a uh, little bit wild Western days. Sure. By the time you came in, you know, we, it was, you know, I mean, it was very, very professional. And um, but I, I, I just my question for you is like as a police chief and not specific to here, 
Um, but w- how important is it for the chief to establish a brand as the chief, a brand for the police department, um, realizing how important that role is within a city? Yeah, I, I, I think it's very important that, uh, that every chief, and every chief wants to, to leave their mark, right? To leave a legacy, if you will. But um, I was very fortunate coming into my situation with Los Alamitos because the previous chief, uh, a gentleman named Todd Mattern, um, he, uh, when he had focused so much on uh, professionalizing the group, it was also uh, the professional training, but also um, formal education. And I think when, I, when he left, 100% of the, uh, of the folks that worked there, were, that were sworn, had uh, a bachelor's degree or or a secondary degree, so um, I had a very uh, educated uh, workforce um, when I started uh, working here. So I was uh, or working there at Los Alamitos. So it was it was a it was a great opportunity to really marshal all of those resources and and try to accomplish the things that I was trying to accomplish, and that was to further. Uh, professionalize our group and to get our folks m- more involved in some of the uh, the um, advocacy that's going on and to be aware of that. Even my um, uh, president, right, of the police association and, and telling him how much he could have an influence on what's happening at the state level because everything starts at the city council level, yep. you know, and county level. So, And then as you, uh, you know, you come in, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, again, I, I'll give you a citizen's perspective that ends up running for elective offices. On the outside, when you're a citizen, you think the police is pretty independent. Um, you know, it seems like, you know, because public safety is when you're running for elected office, doesn't matter what city, it's always like the number one or two issue. Um, and But when you get in as an elected official and you start having interactions with a city manager. Um, usually the police chief does not report directly to a city council. They report to the, the city manager. So, um, but I won't say that this is the way it was in, in Los Al or in Orange County or in the state of California, but I would just say there is a propensity sometimes that city council members feel like the chief works for them. And uh, which puts a lot of pressure, not only for the chief, because he's trying to maintain a middle relationship, which is the city manager, but the city council members sometimes speaking on behalf of the citizens, um, they, you know, they, that's something that has to really be weighed. And so I was just kind of curious your perspective of um, how was that to, is in how important I guess is that for that relationship between city council and city manager when you're trying to be a police chief? Yeah, it's extremely important. Um, especially uh, I think what you need to do with any relationship is develop a significant uh, level of trust, right? And that's demonstrated over time. You just can't have it right out of the chute, you know? Um, part of the, uh, is, and I think you mentioned that they don't work for the uh, mayor or city council directly, but in some ways they do. I mean, because they're members of the community and they're just the representative members of the community. So you work for them as well. Um, the difference is that the city manager is really responsible for the day-to-day operations on how that's being ran, you know, for all departments and the police department being usually the primary largest department, you know, definitely the, uh, on budgetary issues, they seem to be the larger, uh, budget, um, uh, issue for most municipalities. But, um, so you, you really, uh, have to build a very good uh, trusting relationship and a lot of communication, but you also have to be skilled enough to be able to interact with the, with the electeds and you have to understand where they're coming from and the pressures that they feel and, and trying to give them what they need. The care and feeding of, you know, our, we used to call care and feeding of volunteers, but the care and feeding of council, mm-hmm. you know, is, is really important because, you know, they're, um, they're the policy makers and, uh, and the decision makers for the city. So you want to give them the best information possible so when they make those decisions, they don't make an error in that decision because you withheld information or didn't enlighten them into any, something. Something that I learned working with you more than any of the chiefs that I worked with was um, your role in regional law enforcement. Um, you know, within a city, um, you know, there's the city integration uh, with the county. 
Um, a lot of times regionally, all the police departments will pull together like we did for SWAT. Sure. Um, and then at the, the state level, um, a lot of your um, cha uh, charter or policy um, direction comes from the state level. And then federally, uh, any integration that has to happen between the coordination, since you know, Los Alamitos is 105 miles from the border, has a, a lot of things that, that happen that, you know, drugs, immigration that comes through that, where there has to be coordination points with local law enforcement. And so, um, you know, you, you definitely, I think, uh, it was very helpful to know that you were so plugged in. Uh, maybe what the Cal Chiefs was what we'll talk about, but you know, your standing was important to kind of have a seat at the table for our city in those types of matters. How did you view that responsibility? Well, I think that responsibility starts early, right? And we're fortunate that we live in, and, and work in Orange County, which, and I mean this in a very positive way, has been very progressive in terms of law enforcement. And um, because they, and can, uh, there's a, um, uh, there's just a level of professionalism here that you, in communication that you don't see in a lot of different, you know, the 58 counties or whatever it is in the state of California. But uh, we have a once a month meeting uh, with Orange County Chiefs of Police, and that's every city within the in the county, and uh, as well as the Orange County Sheriff, the DA's office, um, and probation. And we all meet once a month at a lunch meeting, and we discuss issues and how better to facilitate the work that we do and serve our communities. And because of that, we have invested in projects like, you know, um, DNA, uh, you know, uh, facial recognition, data uh, bases that we all kind of chipped in. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we have a, a, a program that we actually run that it has nodes that go out throughout the, throughout the country, actually, from the database that we've created and, uh, and some of that was to make uh, resources for like when you have officers go to court, they know when they're on vacation, when they can't be you know, subpoenaed. So all of that stuff, stuff that's really low level or in the weeds kind of stuff you don't think about saves the, the citizens millions of dollars mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we, bought, we found a better way to make it more efficient, more effective. And, and just because uh, you know, we are all collegial with each other. There's no egos, right, that are going on when crimes kind of cross borders because criminals don't know mm -hmm. that there are borders, right? right? They just go where they go yeah. for the opportunity. So uh, and we have a great working relationship and then serving on that board and eventually becoming president of the Orange County Chiefs of Police Sheriff's Association, sitting next to the sheriff, the, you know, my entire time doing that and then really prepared me for uh, roles at, uh, at the state level. Um, one of the last times I wanted to talk to you about within... Um, Los Alamitos and something you were pretty active in was um, you were really big in advocating for officer wellness. And, um, you know, you and I went through a pretty traumatic experience, uh, you, I, and the entire community. Um, you know, uh, 2017, you know, we had um, one of our captains uh, uh, commit suicide and uh, it lived in Seal Beach and, uh, and also involved in a murder of the uh, Westminster city clerk at the same time. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of us, it was one of those things, all of a sudden you turn on the TV and there's something going on and you realize it's in your city. And then you realize it's with your police department. And then you realize you probably know the people that are going through this. And, you know, within officer wellness definitely is an important thing, especially in today's state where um, there just seems to be such an adversarial perspective of law enforcement to the community. Um, can you talk about that from your perspective and what did you learn through that process? Yeah, that, uh, that was obviously an extremely difficult time in, in, in the history of Los Alamitos and, uh, a very long day that day. I don't think I went to sleep for, for half 36 hours and I finally got to bed. Um, but, uh, all during that point, uh, and I want to hand it to the, uh, the city council and the city manager, for allocating the funds that I requested uh, within the first 24 hours. And I asked that we hire a professional company to come in and do debriefing, not only for the police department, but for every uh, employee that worked there and uh, any volunteers, because uh, that captain was a pretty popular captain, long-term employee, and he uh, affected or impacted a lot of the lives that were here 
and uh, and people could not believe what had happened. And so, um, and I think that set the tone uh, for our department realizing that you know the thing we care about, you know, and and I wanted to make them know that the that the council and the, and the city manager were supportive of and cared about was their emo- emotional and mental health, mm-hmm. and that we're going to get through this as a team. And uh, and then from then. That became one of my focuses when I eventually got to Cal Chiefs as president as uh, the mental health issue aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Or, or, Officer I, I, wellness. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah no. And I, I just, uh, I wanted to thank you again. I, I think that was probably one of the toughest moments I had uh, being on the council and going through that process. And um, your leadership definitely reflected through. It was, um, yeah, it's, I, I hate, I don't hate to say it, but it's like, you know, sometimes if you're the mayor or city council member of communities really looking to, you know, those, those roles symbolically, but I think as the police chief, you stood up and, and, uh, you know, and that kind of helped walk us through that. And it was, um, you know, definitely an experience that I think over time kind of helped our community get closer and just, you know, even today, and I'll, I'll just kind of leave this here is that when I see all this activities going on with the perception of pe- people's predetermination view of police, and, and it's a big spread, I don't think it's, um, you know, it's 100% that way, but I do think there's a pretty big size of the population that has a perspective. I, I hope people see stuff like this from the perspective of the pressure that it puts on the law enforcement people, and specifically Captain Moore, who was beloved in our city. And, um, you know, and Amanda Jensen, who needs to be honored for the great woman she was, too. But um, thank you. Um, I want to pivot a little bit now to California police chiefs. Before I go through, you were the 55th president. Yeah, you end up uh, taking that on. Um, You know, if you and I were having a beer talking about this, it would be, uh, (laughs) you know, we'd be talking about that one great year. Right. Yeah. But but the reality is, and that would have been 2020, uh, but the reality is that that was a journey from the time you became a police chief in 2010 to 20. So 10 years you dedicated to that cause. You've explained in Orange County, you worked your way up to show you had regional chops. So talk about your journey to show that you had state chops. First of all, it might take more than one beer. <laughs> this Peace on that one. Yeah. But uh, what happened is I promoted to, or got appointed to chief in uh, La Palma in, in 2010 and immediately joined the Cal Chiefs Association. Can you talk what that is? Just I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm talking like yeah. people okay. would know that. But the California Police Chiefs Association is uh, comprised of 333 municipalities. Uh, and uh, those 300 in, in the state of California, you either have sheriffs or the municipal uh, police. And, uh, and the 333 cities have police chiefs. And so all of those police chiefs belong to the California Police Chiefs Association, and they all have obviously concerns. Most of those concerns are over legislation, and, and most of those pieces of legislation that they're concerned about is, is not only how it affects their ability to do their work and deliver on the service that they're trying to provide, but the local mandates that's, that, that occur that are unfunded. And saying, well, if you're going to require us to do this, and we have no money to do this, because a lot of cities aren't as wealthy as some other cities, and they just can't afford to do it. So uh, we look at uh, Cal Chiefs is a, is a uh, spends a lot of time in their advocacy group uh, and legislative group trying to review legislation and then also speaking towards that. They're also a component of uh, training and bringing some of the highest level of training that uh, is manageable to executives and people wanting to become executives, you know, and, and uh, so they do a lot of preparation work, even for support staff like uh, the, the uh, administrative um, uh, secretaries and uh, executives, uh, giving them training on how to, the, the, the care and feeding of a chief, if you will. Mm-hmm. So there is a lot of different training, and there's a component now with officer wellness that happened under my watch that started a committee for officer wellness. And uh, so they do a lot of training on officer wellness. But um, for me personally, I I started off as a committee member for the legislative committee. And then uh, we we didn't have uh, kind of the professionalism that we do now. Now we have a a lobbyist and a firm that actually handles a lot of the heavy lift that we used to do. We used to actually take home all those pieces of legislation, pour over them, highlight, then track and trend all these things and report out on a monthly basis of where they were in the, in the process. But I, I did that for several years and then became the chair of that committee. And then I was asked to chair other committees uh, or be on other committees. And then eventually 
there was a position on the board itself, and then I was asked to serve on the board, um, and I was the representative for Orange County serving on the board, and then I became, um, I was asked eventually to become the third vice president, and, uh, and I was installed as the third vice president when they installed the new you know, officers, and then I worked my way up until, you know, second, third, uh, first, and then eventually president. Wow. And um, I, I got a question for you. So you came on the board, um, or you, you know, you did that. You end up being president April 2020, um, one month prior to to that, the George Floyd incident happens, mm-hmm. um, and you know, kind of the significant uh, reality of that happening is that there was a call nationally for police reform. Um, you know, uh, and you know, depending on where different people are on police and the issues. Um, you know, everything from defund the police to, you know, flying the flag with a blue line and say, I'm totally 100% with police, no sure. matter what. Um, here you are at the most really important role as president of Cal Chiefs. So you represent, you know, the chiefs of all of California and what they say nationally, where California goes, the nation goes. And, um, but this is in Min- Minneapolis. Talk about the pressures that you had at that point. And I will be honest, I, I remember following you a little bit through this process as, um, you know, and how you would handle it. And it, it seemed to be like a calming, like um, trying to remind people where the state had already made significant progress in some of these issues. But I don't know it as well as you do. Could you explain that a little bit and what your perspective was? Sure. Um, it, it was... Uh... It was shocking for us to see what was happening, you know, in Minneapolis and what had happened uh, to Mr. Floyd. And um, uh, and we knew that our training, at least at our level at, uh, in the state of California and at our department specifically, uh, that's not the kind of thing that we would do. And it didn't make a whole lot of sense. We thought initially that it was just a, a regional issue. And then it, it just exploded, as you said, right? And there was this national reform for policing, which was interesting to us in, in the business of, you know, advocacy and lobbying and all that stuff at the Cal Chief level, because um, they were asking for eight specific, and I don't remember call all of them, but specific reforms in policing and the immediate eight, you know, and, and uh, eight can't wait is one of the campaigns that was, they were saying, but out of the eight, seven of them we already had in California. The only one that we didn't uh, hadn't uh, resolved at that point was the uh, uh, the carotid restraint hold, and uh, so they and which they wanted to you know, have outlawed, you know, and uh, and a number of agencies in the state of California actually didn't have it in their policy um, or didn't use it, you know. Uh, so it was it was kind of confounding in a way because uh, not that the rest of the country didn't understand this, but that our own legislators that have worked on some of the legislation itself Mm -hmm. to meet the needs that were being, you know, demanded now by the, by the nation Mm -hmm. uh, on that, on that side of the argument that, uh, that you guys, we actually did, we worked together on these things and we've already made those reforms last year, two Mm -hmm. years ago, Mm -hmm. you know, three years ago, even we were, we, like you said, we, we were ahead of the game and we were, you know, setting this trend uh, long before this ever came up, before it became necessary. Right. And, uh, and that was kind of disheartening for me as, as a leader of the organization to see how short the memories were Mm -hmm. and how emotional people reacted to it versus looking at it, you know, just logically and, and and really pragmatically and, and taking account for the good work that they did do already as legislators. And, uh, and then the other thing was that uh, secondary to that uh, was COVID hit. And that compounded our ability to, to really impact or really have the relationship. Because for me, that I was telling you about relationships earlier built on trust. Well, same thing with legislation. Um, it, they had to be able uh, to trust you that you're giving them the best information possible. Well, you can't build that relationship of trust necessarily on Zoom mm-hmm. or, you know, and, and the technology was really weak back then. I don't know if you remember. I mean, mm-hmm. it was just brand new and people were trying to get on, you know, a lot of some corporate, you know, America was good at, you know, those kinds of things because they've been using the technology for a while. Mm-hmm. But government wasn't and uh, and it was just not a good way to communicate initially. And uh, we were not, uh, Cal Chiefs was always allowed a seat at the table and sometimes at the head of the table 
for all the law enforcement leadership. And then all of a sudden we weren't even allowed in the room. That was disheartening. Yeah. When, when you and I were working together, um, you know, we had a, a situation with sanctuary law and, um, what I really learned working with you on that was that it was important that you were the chief. You definitely knew everything that we needed, but I think your advice to me too on uh, how legislation was formed and certain laws when they kind of get in there. And, and I guess the net of it was, you know, you and I talked about this off mic. So, but you know, every year they, the legislature goes through about 2000 bills. And I think you had said about 250 of those uh, become law enforcement issues and the, the thing that I remember is that your experience as the president at that point, I think you were the second vice president um, at, when we worked together, but the, the governor, you know, uh, would come and basically, you know, when they, they, when they get to those 250, even if they make it through legislature um, and get passed, they have to go to the governor to be signed. The governor calls you guys in and um, at least my perception, I'm, I'm not going to speak for, for what he does, but sure. it, it, the perception that I have was that, you know, you guys are almost like their advisors. Like, does this make sense? If I'm going to veto something, uh, you know, on good grounds, uh, because maybe special interests has taken over. And, you know, when you have a kind of one party system in the state of California, uh, it's refreshing to hear sometimes the, the governor will, will use the veto power to stop things that truly aren't in our best interests, um, you know, because they are not getting vetted at within the legislation. So, that role seemed to be a pretty important one. And although during COVID, it wasn't, you weren't able to do face to face with governor and legislation, you had a lot of experience doing that before. Yeah. We, um, what we found too is that um, everybody has constituents. So they have to kind of go at things uh, um, in a manner that supports their support, right? Mm -hmm. In the future votes. But um, what we found is that the leadership itself, sometimes, you know, the, uh, the pro tem of the Senate the leader of the assembly, um, we would go to them a lot and say, this is why this bill is bad. And let me run this down. And we, and you, and you know, sometimes it's their, their, uh, the, um, uh, their person that's in charge of their office. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and they listen to them, their ledge person and they, they get it. And so they explain it to the assembly person or the Senate and say, hey, this this is what's not you know so good, and why we don't really want to do this. So the leadership sometimes will prevent that from ever going to the floor for a vote in the first place, mm -hmm. because what happens behind the scenes is they talk to the governor, because mm -hmm. as you said, it's pretty much a one party system here in California. So they tell the governor, said, hey, you know, this is not good, mm -hmm. and the gov you know, you're going to have to veto this, and the governor doesn't want to be vetoing vetoing everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So he says, well, then you better take care of it at your level. So it doesn't reach my level, mm -hmm. and uh, they'll and that's what would happen sometimes. So some and they would just go back to the author and just tell him, "Hey, listen, you're not going to get enough votes. We did a straw poll. And you're not going to get the votes for us. So we don't want to embarrass you, embarrass anybody else, or strong arm any of our. And so you know we're going to ask you to remove it, and they would remove it. Mm -hmm. When you're going through the process, um, and now that you are kind of out of Cal Chiefs, and you kind of look back, um, you know I. I was uh, DHS, the largest law enforcement agency, and so it was interesting. Is that I go back and forth between DC and and uh, you know LA. Uh, I you know recruitment seems to be a big problem with you know police departments and quite honestly within the federal um, law enforcement too. And uh, I know you still remain active in some of the issues out there and you know, some of the legislature that uh, is focused on. And I was just curious if, uh, you know, you would want to talk at all about some of the legislature like AB 89, which focuses on minimum wage requirements for law enforcement, and maybe give people kind of an idea of, you know, one issue as an example of, um, you know, how you still stay involved and, and, and give the listeners a perspective of how important these types of policies could be. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that director uh, Leslie McGill of the Cal Chiefs had, uh, reached out to me and asked me, you know, she had talked to Jonathan Feldman, who's our key lobbyist, and said, hey, who would be good on this uh, thing? And he says, well, I know he's no longer a chief, but uh, an act, he's retired, but um, he was started this process and, and he has good relationships and understands it. So they asked me, even though I'm retired, to stay on this working group uh, for AB 89. And, um, and the reason why is because it started off that you couldn't hire a police officer until they were 25 years of age. 
um, that they had to have a bachelor's degree. And, uh, you know, so when you think about it, most people that are going to go to get their formal education, they're going to graduate at 22, more than likely, 23. Right. What are they going to do for two years? You know, they're going to work in their field and, mm -hmm. and there's not going to be an interest to get somebody in law enforcement, you know, necessarily. So, and, and if you're going to go to college, you're probably not looking to go into law enforcement. You're looking to go on some other professional career path. So um, the recruitment pool is very difficult as it is right now. Um, and so we said uh, we need to, uh, you know, we need to look at this and try to trim this down. And, 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 and so I stayed on this committee even after for the last year working with uh, the state of California's um, community college regions, uh, all the, all the stakeholders, uh, that would have to have develop a curriculum for this thing called modern policing degree. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then bring, uh, and then look at the age things, which we brought back down and recommended that, you know, okay, it's 21. Um, that's, you know, we have to do bar checks when we're cops, right? So you can't get into a bar unless you're 21. <laughs> right, so right. there's no way we're going to hire somebody younger than that. And then, um, and, uh, and then, you know, and then let's start off with something like an AA, and then as they work in the career, get more experience as being cop, then they can go ahead and go into and get their uh, modern policing degree and uh, and then hire, you know, and then have that, but uh, not make that a requirement for hire initially. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of some of the recommendations, and I won't go into them all, but uh, there was a number of things. It took, like I said, over a year of meetings uh, to get this accomplished. And so that's, the recommendations are sitting with the author and some other folks in the state, and uh, we'll see what turns. Yeah, it's out. interesting, Eric. I um, again um, in corporate America now, but I I definitely follow that, and I'm also very active with veterans, um, you know, in a lot of different veterans groups. And it wasn't just people that have college degrees that may have to wait for two years, but veterans that go and serve our country for two to four years to have to wait. You know, once they get out, they need work and they're the best qualified. Some of them have clearances already. Um, great talent pool. Um, so I, I was, you know, that's probably what got my attention too. Is like, it just, um, it seemed like a bridge a little too far. Yeah. Well, to be on, I mean, to be fair to the author, they, he, he kind of recognized the military too, and they were trying to figure out a carve out mm. for the military experience, you know, but it wasn't clear at that point what that would be and what that would look like. Oh, okay. Um, kind of uh, getting ready to kind of close this off a little bit. Uh, I was just kind of curious, you know, when you look at the law enforcement environment kind of post George Floyd and you see and people that are out there that are thinking about law enforcement as a career and uh, being able to kind of look at this for the longer term what what do you think is uh, the perspective of these new folks that are going to get ready to come out of the academy and you know the perception of you know what the career that they're coming after and it just seems from a guy that's not in law enforcement it's it's you never want to go into a career where you could just have that one file issue and your whole career could be over. Like in corporate, you know, if, if it didn't work out, my first job at GE or Boeing or wherever, I would just go to, you know, fill in the blank. Right. Uh, there's 500 other Fortune 500 companies to go after. And you just kind of keep going until you find your spot. But, you know, once you have a significant issue in law enforcement, you could be done and there's not like you transition. So I was just kind of curious your perspective of um, the, the the health and the state of the recruitment pool and of the candidates that are coming out and what type of a career they possibly have ahead of them. Do you think they look at it for the 30 years like you did? Well, even I didn't look at it for 30 years when I first joined. <laughs> you know, I mean, that just seemed like, I didn't, you know, impossible. But uh, I, I, my, I salute those uh, young men and women uh, because they are coming into this thing and, and then they're coming into it with eyes wide open because they grew up watching it on TV, right? And they've seen from two th uh, September 11th, you know, where all the firefighters and the police were heroes and, you know, and everybody loved them. And then 20 years later, you know, they're asking for police reform and, and they're they're vilified. Mm -hmm. and uh, And sometimes, like you said, over one issue involving maybe four people, out of the 900,000 police officers or law enforcement officers that there are in the country. And uh, being, you know, painted over that wide brush like that as, as being that and not looking at all the other good work that gets done on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my hat's really off to them for that. And I, and I think what keeps them, um, 
you know, it, it, it has impacted the recruitment pool. Uh, a lot of people didn't want to become uh, police officers or deputy sheriffs as a result of what they were seeing. And, and their families, too, didn't want them to, you know, be put in harm's way. Uh, there was a lot of violence against police officers and all that uh, unnecessarily, you know. I mean, just from people that aren't even, you know, like weren't criminal necessarily, but had this agenda uh, that they hated police. And we mm-hmm. became the pariah, you know. And uh, and I think that uh, uh, the focus on them, and I, I know the focus that I try to do even when I teach uh, some courses to managers is, to never forget how noble this profession is. And it's only noble when we do it for the, you know, the right way for the right reasons and never lose your, you know, your focus, you know, your, your compass to true North and, and, um, and, and your hope, you know, and, and that, and I think because they're doing it for a greater reason that that helps. And this is, you know, we, 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 we hire for character, Mm -hmm. but we train for competency. And that's what we're getting now is a lot of folks that have a lot of character and, uh, God bless them. Yeah, no, I agree. God bless them, and I'm I'm glad that uh, people step in the void at this point with, um, you know, all the kind of different activities that are going on. And I, I guess I got a question. You've always been kind of a facts and figures guy when I've dealt with you in a professional realm. Um, I, I want to talk. The last question I have is around um, the perception of is crime getting worse? And and I'll give you two perspectives. Um, obviously, I'm a corporate guy. You know, so I don't see it a lot on the retail level. Um, I live between, you know, Washington, D.C. and L.A. And in, in D.C., um, my wife will call me while I'm there and she'll go, oh, my God, it's so bad. She'll see stuff on TV. And I'll have just spent, you know, eight hours going from one side of the city to the next in the type of role that I have, uh, taking uh, Metro, Uber, <laughs> and I, I don't see any, and I don't right. feel unsafe. And some nights, uh, you know, coming back on the Metro at the latest point. So, you know, there's the perce- perception and, and the and the facts and figures, by the way, support that DC is dangerous. So I'm not saying it's not, okay. but I'm just not seeing it at right. my level, at the retail level where that I'm at. But you come back to California, and you hear that, you know, uh, South Coast Plaza, they have tremendous amounts uh, and smash and grabs, like blatant stuff. I have a family member that is, um, uh, it runs pretty big, runs big jewelry business in the jewelry district in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, they have cameras everywhere. And, but once or twice a week, there's armed robbery that just, they happen. People don't use handguns to protect themselves because it's too dangerous to do. And it's almost a little bit of an accepted cost of doing business, but everybody's very fearful. And so like this level of acceptance. So using my two data points, you know, it's hard for me to see is California seem more dangerous uh, than maybe it was four or five years ago when you and I worked together, or is it just the media just seems to be making it seem that way. And as a business person, you know, I kind of sit back looking at both sides of this going, I, 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 I need to verify. And so I was just kind of curious for the listeners, you're somebody that's kind of informed and you see the facts and figures, what would be your perception of when you look around California at this point? Yeah. And, and for me, this all started in 2011, you know, when we had uh, realignment through um, the state of California for probation and parole mm-hmm. and the early release of prisoners. And there was something like 30,000 p- people that were or, uh, prisoners that were released from state prison. Um, and it just got progressively worse with some of the legislation that was going on. And, uh, and as well as some of really Californians themselves, you know, uh, voting in our, you know, uh, referendum kind of uh, uh, that we have here, you know, um, for different propositions you know, um, and so m- my feeling is this, is that it's, it's, it's not a simple issue that you can really look at the numbers because the numbers reflect reports that are made, right? Well, a lot of people aren't right, are making those reports because they know that the police come out and take a report, but even if they catch the guy, the DAs in some of these cities, you know, aren't filing charges against him. And if they file charges against them, state legislation has changed the punishment of these crimes. In fact, the definition, you know, of some of these crimes so that they're no longer, or categories, so they're no longer even felonies, you know, now they're misdemeanors. So they think, they throw their hands up in the air, and I understand why the public is doing this. Like, well, why are we even trying to 
report these because what are they going to get? A ticket? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, they won't even spend a day in jail, possibly, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and and that's, you know, and, and so, you know, that's why it's a very, it's like an onion. You have to peel back all the layers mm -hmm. and then you start seeing what's out there. Because, yeah, I think, I think the numbers have increased a lot of prop, a lot more property type crimes, as you, uh, as you alluded to. Um, you know, the violent crimes are going to be the violent crimes that, you know, that get the attention. But even some of those have gone, you know, they've been marginalized and minimalized. And, and it's really sad because we should be victim focused on in the state of California, you know, and, and, uh, and we're not necessarily. And, uh, that's the part that, you know, and, and, you know, I'm not trying to be political about this. I'm just telling you from an advocate yeah. of, of public safety that I would like to see us be more caring about the victims of crimes and, uh, and not, uh, you know, not the people that are actually committing the crimes. Yeah, it was interesting. I was at South Coast Plaza over the weekend down uh, Newport Beach, Costa Mesa area. And, you know, it's a, a really nice shopping area. And I noticed that there was many businesses that had armed guards standing out <laughs> in, in, in front of the... And so I hadn't seen that since I've been in Mexico. Yeah. Um, I, I And so I was just... I, and so I, again, I just, uh, maybe I'm using this to check my data and my perception and perspective. So I appreciate you kind of, um, you know, giving us your view and, um, you know, I think a lot of people look at the way things are right now. And, um, you know, we also want to try to, um, do our part and, and make this a great place. You know, California is a great place. So, uh, Eric, I, I, Really wanted to tell you, first and foremost, thank you. It, it's a little bit of a reunion, uh, having the opportunity of uh, meeting with you and, and talking. It kind of reminded me a little bit. I, I think we'll, both of us caught ourselves in this discussion like we might have been sitting across the uh, conference table in the back room of the right. council. I certainly remember that I'm I'm not there right now. But, um, you know, thank you for all of your service that you've provided. Thank you for your military service. And, uh, and I know the listeners are going to find a tremendous amount of value with what you shared with us today. Well, thank you, Troy. And thank you for all your service as well. Cool. And, and your guitar playing. There you go. So <laughs> here we go. We're going to get off mic here because it's time for a little guitar jam. Yeah. We'll talk to you. Thank you again. Thanks again for joining me today on the Ameritocracy Show. Be sure to follow me on social media and our website at troyedgar.com, where you can get more information and sign up for my weekly email. I hope you have a great week.